Yes, sir. I believe this is the, going to be the last one. Last question. Please. I have a comment first that bears on uh, your reference to uh, Pat Schroeder and her, her suggestion about the difference between uh, guerrillas and, and the difficulty of uh, arguing about genocide. And it goes back to Dominic Copper's uh, point uh, about the relationship between animal and human rights. The, the UN Convention on Genocide came up before the United States Senate, I believe, five times before it was finally ratified. It was defeated four times uh, with the opposition behind it of the American Bar Association and many other groups. And when it was finally passed, it was passed with such conditions and such riders as to, in effect, disable American commitment to, uh, to the UN Convention. That would, took place over a period of something like 25 years. The Endangered Species Act passed on its first reading at the Senate and by unanimous, a uh, virtually unanimous vote by consensus. The question I have uh, goes back to the, what seems to me a tension in, uh, in, in your comments between uh, the fir very first point you made about national interest as, uh, uh, somehow challenging and efforts and defeating efforts uh, to raise the issue of, of genocide or to raise the charge of genocide. Uh, and uh, that seems, the, the tension that uh, seems to me to have, uh, uh, be present there is that in your concluding comments, I mean, which were, gave some grounds for hope, you pointed to the internationalization of of uh, of the institutions that were equipped uh, and that had in fact been effective. I mean, the International Criminal Court is, a, in my view, an astounding accomplishment that it, it that it exists. That there are indeed prosecutions of criminals on an international basis, even with, as we know, the opposition of the United States uh, towards those institutions. But then it seems to me that there's a moral to be drawn to that. It's true that you suggest that there's a grass, uh, grass tops, grassroots movement within the United States. But as long as the nation state is the basic unit of organization, and as long as national interest is going to be the prime mover of, of the nation state, then it seems to me that the moral is obvious that uh, that there needs to be an, institu an international institutionalization, not only of punishing criminals, but of a warning system of something that's done at the time when the actions are actually being taken. I mean, so that this would call for, whether under the auspices of the UN or under some other international uh, uh, aegis of an institution that would in fact be able to sound the alarm on an international level okay. and that one, uh, a feature of that might well be a standing, a standing armed force that could be used to intervene. One of the problems, as we well know, is that for each, each occasion, the lead, it's a leading question and I'm asking <laughs> us. <laughs> so, well, okay. The question is, what, insti it. what institution would would you recommend for for this si kind of early warning or okay. this uh, tripwire that might serve the function prior to the commission, uh, the it, committing okay. of genocide? Sorry, I need a drink. <laughs> so I want to answer the question. Can I answer the question now? Is it? Can I answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I, I, sorry, I've been up a lot for a long day. So let me answer the question. So um, as best I, I understand it, the, first of all, the tension that you describe um, between, on the one hand, uh, reifying or um, describing the reification of national interests, as I have done, and believing that international institutions are indispensable in patrolling the commons and ultimately, in having member states, nation states, chain themselves to the mast to fight off their lesser angels, you know, so they're, they're thank you, it'll just gonna slip it up. <laughs> um, uh, but that, I mean, that tension is, is 
is real. That's, that's the paradox on which, as you know, the international system has been built, that we know we can't trust states, which is why we have international treaty. We know we can't trust national laws and so forth. That was the lesson of Hitler, is you could just legalize extermination. So you have to have higher laws, and yet what do we do in 1945? Of course, we, we rely on the very same states we know we can't trust to enforce those laws and to comprise those international institutions. But to think, I mean, you weren't suggesting this, but a lot of people when they talk about UN reform and or the kinds of institution building you're describing in the, in the context of early warning or, or standing army, that that can be done at an international level. It, it, it can, it, it, it has to be done un, un, unless we change our whole order, which you know would be welcome, but isn't gonna happen anytime soon given who has the power and who have the guns. Um, it has to be done by convincing those building blocks, those nation states who comprise the UN, that it is in their national interest to give something up in the short term in order to get something back in the long term. And to think, I mean, for people you know who believe in the UN and so forth have, have been talking about UN reform for as long as the UN has existed. Um, and they will go every five or 10 years to the UN, nothing will have been done internally or domestically to build a constituency for reform because everybody thinks these issues can be handled by foreign policy professionals and by international lawyers. And so the states, which amount to sort of black billiard balls, end up coming together, unable to agree, because nothing has changed inside them. The priorities and the rankings and the valuation of international institutions has not changed in this country except to decline. The only reason the Genocide Convention passed was because it was in Ronald Reagan's domestic political interest to make it pass because he had just gone to the Bitburg Cemetery in Germany and had offended Jewish groups and wanted something to offset it. The way that the UN will ultimately find a constituency in this country is when we do as we're doing now finally around global warming and we understand that you can't deal with transnational threats unless you strengthen transnational institutions. You can't, just as a structural matter. Counterterrorism provides an opportunity to, to reintroduce Americans to international institutions because we cannot get cells you know, in, in 111 countries on our own. And I think actually paradoxically, or, or, but the, the loss of faith in our competence creates an opening and a moment to potentially actually invigorate the conversation about you know, a different relationship to international institutions. And I'll just in closing, the, the book I'm writing is on exactly this. It's a biography of Sergio Vieira de Mello, who was the, the best the UN ever produced, and he would have been the next Secretary General after Kofi Annan, but he was blown up in Iraq by the first ever suicide bomber in Iraq. And he was a sort of decathlete of nation building, and a person who balanced liberty and security and did an incredible job seducing the United States and other sort of skeptics of the UN trying to get resources from them and, and political commitments from them. But what, what, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm not just doing the book this time, but doing a, 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 a feature documentary that'll be out in the movie theaters and also a major Hollywood biopic about Sergio is that I think we've never had a face for the UN and for international uh, institutions. All we've had are UN scandals, Republican vitriol, Democratic cowardice, on one side of the ledger, and then some warm fellow feeling by people like us who, who believe in the UN, but we, don't, we, haven't, we haven't made it a politically relevant and a politically uh, supported entity you know, in this society. And international law is the same thing, and that's why international law in a time of crisis proved as vulnerable as it did. The only constituency it had, and thank God they existed, were uniform military. You know, ordinary Americans, you know, didn't you know? Didn't complain when when these these treaties were were you know when, when we turned our backs upon them and and when we denied people certain protections and and that has to change and I'm hoping Sergio because I think there has to be a human face there has to be a story that penetrates politics if we're going to change our politics and, and our relationship to these higher bodies. I'm going to give you a Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.